Our next speaker is Dr. Peter Klein. Peter is, teaches economics at the University of Missouri, uh, author of a number of books and important papers. Um, but the, the, to me, the best news about him, at least recently, is the fact that he's the new executive director of the Institute. And he's at uh, Missouri for the rest of this year, and then he'll be coming full time to Auburn uh, at, the, uh, uh, at the end of June. And we're very glad to have him. Uh, I, I could tell a lot of stories about Peter, but I'll, I'll just mention that uh, in 1988, uh, he was graduating from, from uh, Chapel Hill and going to Berkeley to get his PhD in economics. And he wanted some help and probably some uh, comradeship, too. Uh, and I, he, he sent a letter, and I, I called Murray Rothbard, and I said, Murray, I've just gotten the most extraordinary letter I've ever seen from a student. I said, this, this, is, this kid is amazing. May I fax this to you? And if you agree, would you talk to him? And of course, Murray uh, began Peter's association with the Institute, and uh, been quite extraordinary. He worked closely with Murray, uh, uh, Bert Blummert, and, uh, and others, and uh, we're very proud of him. I, feel, I sort of feel paternal towards him. Uh, and I'll just, I could tell a number of stories, but I'll just add one more. When Peter got his PhD, he was uh, invited because of a, a member of the Berkeley faculty to spend a year of internship on Bill Clinton's Council of Economic Advisors in, in Washington. So about, uh, so one day I got a visit from the FBI. Uh, the FBI, from their Opelika office, who knew the FBI had an Opelika, Alabama <laughs> office? <clears throat> So they said, we want to, we want, we're doing background check on uh, Peter Klein, security check, and we'd like to talk to you about him uh, concerning his internship. And I said, but his internship ended about three months ago. And the guy said, you know the government. I said, well, OK, I, I do know the government. Uh, so expect more great things from Peter in terms of uh, uh, all the work he's going to do for the Institute. And he's going to talk to us now about interstate highways, radar, and TANG. Does war provide and promote technological innovation? Dr. Klein. Uh, it's been a privilege to be associated with the Mises Institute for 24 years now. And I'm looking forward to many more years of successful uh, collaboration. Uh, many of you remember uh, several weeks ago, uh, President Obama uh, got himself in a little bit of trouble for uttering the now infamous remark, uh, you didn't build that, referring to entrepreneurs uh, who create small businesses. Now, the president's defenders immediately pointed out that in context, the president was not meaning to denigrate small business owners or to indicate a lack of appreciation for entrepreneurship, but rather the president was trying to highlight the critical role of government spending in creating the environment in which entrepreneurship and small business can thrive. The, the president's remarks were as follows. He said, somebody helped to create this unbelievable American system that we have that allowed you to thrive, small business people. Somebody invested in roads and bridges. If you've got a business, you didn't build that. Somebody else made that happen. The internet didn't get invented on its own. Government research created the internet so that all the companies could make money off the internet. In other words, according to the president, lots of people benefit from government spending, including you tech entrepreneurs who use the internet uh, to, 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 to innovate and to create value for consumers. And of course, when the president me says, uh, somebody built these roads and bridges, somebody made these investments, of course, he means the state. Right, The state is the somebody that, according to the president, is sort of making everything happen. Um, you know, in context, I think the president's remarks are even worse <laughs> than they were made out to be by uh, the Romney camp and the president's critics. You know, what, what Obama is getting at is a very popular fallacy, and that's this notion that government spending on scientific research and on technological development is critical to scientific progress, to technological progress, and to, economics, uh, to economic progress. This share is viewed by almost all mainstream social scientists and most uh, politicians, of course. Uh, you know, e even scholars who are otherwise favorably disposed to the free market 
will argue that some goods and services, such as basic scientific research, and even a lot of applied research and development, have certain characteristics. These are so-called public goods, which the free market cannot provide and must be, therefore, provided uh, by the state. Now, a general critique of this public goods argument will have to wait for another day. A number of uh, economists from the Austrian school and elsewhere have shown pretty convincingly uh, that this is a very poor rationale for government spending. But today I want to focus specifically on this argument that government spending on science and on technology is vital for the development of, you know, vital for technological uh, and economic progress. Uh, this argument, uh, it's often been pointed out, is used as a rationale to justify not only war, but the establishment of a sort of permanent military industrial complex. One benefit of warfare and one benefit of vast government expenditures on warfare, according to some uh, many scholars, <laughs> is that we get all these wonderful new technologies. We get spin-offs of government R&D that lead to valuable uh, consumer products, right? Government uh, uh, interstate highways being a great example, right? The interstate highway system was uh, um, established by President Eisenhower not to facilitate the movement of citizens throughout the United States or to facilitate uh, commerce by allowing cargo truck uh, cargo to travel by truck rather than rail, but was to facilitate the quick and easy mobilization of people and materials for war. Right? Eisenhower, as, as a general, uh, when the, uh, had seen Hitler's Autobahn system in Germany and marveled at the ability of the Germans to move uh, armaments and soldiers quickly across the German uh, state, and he wanted the same kind of setup for America. But people will argue, okay, fine, so the interstate highway system was designed to facilitate military transportation, but so what? Now we have it for civilian use, and isn't that great? Uh, radar, if you look at, uh, if, if, if you study this argument, if you look at the history of technology and 20th century history more generally, you often hear people argue that one of the great things to come out of World War II was the technology of radar. Now, radar, uh, of course, the, uh, the, the, the Basic research on radar had been conducted long before in the late 19th century by a number of scientists, including uh, uh, a Dr. Hertz in Germany. But it's true that during the late 1930s and early 1940s, British and American scientists worked very hard to refine the technology, to implement the technology, and to make usable radar stations on the ground, on airplanes, uh, sonar technology, uh, sonar using the similar technology uh, in, in boats and submarines. And so it is argued we would not have the marvelous air transportation system that we have today if it hadn't been for the government developing radar to try to beat its enemies uh, on the battlefield. I don't know what Mr. Hertz and these World War II scientists would have thought of TSA, but that's a subject uh, also for another day. Um, and who can forget Tang, right? Tang, the instant breakfast drink. For years, it was said that Tang was a product of the Apollo program. Uh, it turns out even NASA now admits that Tang had nothing to do with, uh, that, that Tang was created uh, uh, by, by a large food company and was used by astronauts, but was not in any way created by uh, NASA. So the argument, in a nutshell, that one hears from the defenders of war and the defenders of the military industrial complex is that war has some side benefits uh, that are good for society. You know, not only does it help to mobilize all of society's resources in some important shared national purpose, give us civic pride and the martial spirit, of course, through coercion and exploitation and abuse, of course, uh, but it also gives us new technology, and isn't that great? Um, you know, we could spend a lot of time going through examples, further examples of technologies developed for military use. Uh, some of them are obvious, the atomic bomb, uh, which was uh, research on which led to the development of uh, nuclear energy for civilian use, for generating electricity. Uh, but, but also some sort of uh, administrative improvements, uh, logistics, Techniques for you know, loading and unloading ships that were developed during World War II have now been adopted by commercial transportation companies. Uh, the whole discipline of operations research 
the systematic analysis of flows of materials through production stages and so forth was developed uh, by uh, economists and others during World War II and subsequently adopted by a number of large companies. Uh, a lot of these uh, innovations come out of, uh, inventions come out of World War II. Um, computing, early uh, digital computing devices were developed during World War II to help break the Enigma code, the Germans' Enigma code, for example. And then in the Cold War, Right in the Cold War, we got uh, the, the first real computer, the, the ENIAC, uh, world's first general purpose digital computer, which was developed by military researchers, not for any commercial application. It was not designed to solve uh, scientific problems or designed to help with commerce. It was designed to improve the uh, performance of battlefield artillery. That was what these complex, the reason those complex calculations were needed was to calculate the effectiveness of different kinds of artillery techniques. Um, but again, moving to social science, the whole discipline of game theory, right, which is often used by, uh, you know, by business strategists today and a number of other social scientists for peaceful uses. Game theory has many weaknesses, of course. But uh, uh, these techniques were developed by researchers at the RAND Corporation and elsewhere during the Cold War uh, on your dollars, operating on your taxpayer dollars. So what can we say about this argument? I mean, it, it, it is absolutely true that we do have a number of technologies that, are, uh, th that were enabled by public spending uh, th th directed by uh, uh, the military establishment. That, that, that's absolutely true. Is that an argument in favor of military spending or of a large establishment, a large military industrial complex? I think the right, well, of course, the answer is no, and there are a couple of different ways we can address this argument. Now, one is to, one approach is to look at individual cases in a bit more detail and evaluate, well, what kind of research was actually done, what, technology, what technologies were embraced by the government scientists, what alternative technologies were available. Uh, how efficient or effective was the work that was done relative to feasible alternatives. And it turns out if one studies any of these cases in detail, you know, beyond the bumper sticker, thanks to the government we have radar kind of approach, right, you find that the, the details are extremely messy. And as we would expect, right, from our general understanding of how efficient government is, how well government functions, Right, we would find that in, uh, one can easily articulate reasons why these programs did not work very well. The technologies that were developed were highly inefficient relative to feasible alternatives. Uh, the, the execution was, was, uh, was, was not good. Um, there are a number of historical legacies of government investment in particular technologies that continue to haunt us today. R radar's an interesting example that um, uh, you know, uh, commercial aviation uh, after World War II was in many ways, of course, r reliant on these advances in radar technology. But there are a number of problems with the kind of radar implementations that were used, problems that persist even until this day. Uh, the U.S., uh, I once did a study of the U.S. air traffic control system about 10 years ago, and uh, the U.S. air traffic control system is highly inefficient, relies on very outdated, antiquated a technology that was that was essentially developed during World War II. Um, users of government developed radar have had a hard time adopting newer and improved technologies because they have huge investments in the government legacy version of radar. There are a number of other cases like this that we can look at where we can poke holes in the particular arguments that are used to explain why these technologies are desirable. But there's a much more basic theoretical problem with this kind of argument. I mean, it is certainly true that in many cases, the government spends money on building things and doing things that otherwise would not have been built or done. Is that an argument in favor of building or doing? And of course, uh, just a few moments reflection uh, will we'll let you realize the answer is no, right? I mean, think of the pyramids Right? It's true that if there hadn't been a pharaoh with access to a huge supply of slave labor, 
along with all sorts of other technological complements, architects and builders and stonemasons and you know, slave masters who could whip the slaves and so on, right? a complex ecosystem of technological, uh, with technological complementarities, to use the modern jargon, we wouldn't have the pyramids. Right? Does that mean that the pyramids, the creation of the pyramids was good for you know, the people of Egypt? Right? No, of course it was a monument to the pharaoh and, 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 and the pharaoh's own uh, godlike position and so forth. Right? The government builds monuments to itself all over the place. Giant, ugly statues and museums and so forth. And you can say, well, gosh, you know, the private sector wouldn't have built the Lincoln Memorial. Well, <laughs> yes, that's exactly right. <laughs> In other words, the fact that something exists as, as the result of government expenditure is not an argument that it creates any sort of economic value. Moreover, uh, in a lot of these cases, when the government spends money on X, right, it, it may be creating something or building something that the private sector was already doing, and the government sort of takes advantage of that and maybe steers it in a slightly different direction. Right? So at best, government spending is harmless in this sense, right, in the sense of determining what the output is, because it's simply subsidizing, it's simply substituting the private money that would have been used to produce something with public money that produced the same thing. Or, in most cases, it makes us substantially worse off because it, uh, it leads to the creation of things that we otherwise wouldn't have and that we don't want, that we don't want. Of course, I'm not arguing that government spending is ever neutral. Right? But I'm saying in terms of the specific technologies that we have, government either co-opts existing technology uh, or it changes the technology into something that the market would, uh, would not have provided, but which we would have preferred to have been provided by the market. I mean, you know, President Obama used the internet, and the internet is a great example. There's a lot of literature on this. I I've written a little bit on this myself. Uh, you know, it's true that... Uh, Al Gore notwithstanding, right, the government did play a substantial role in the design and infrastructure of the internet, but that role was not all for the good. There are a number of reasons why alternative private competing networks would have done a better job of creating a, a global information uh, network uh, than, than uh, the government, the one that the government uh, created. You know, I need only call your attention to the famous fallacy of the broken window from uh, given to us by Frederick Bastiat and popularized by Henry Hazlitt, right? You know, the, 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 the specific technologies that come out of wartime R&D bureaus are like the pane of glass in Bastiat's story, right? I mean, we see them, right? And we say, wow, isn't it great that we have radar? Isn't it great that we have the internet? Isn't it great that we have the interstate highway system, right? But what we, what we do not see what Bastiat called the unseen, right, is the technologies that we would have had if resources had not been taken from the public and used to favor government contractors and government-connected scientists and so on. We don't see the technologies we would have if the private sector had been allowed to produce them in the absence of a giant militaristic government. Now, uh, the history of uh, government-funded science is extremely interesting, especially uh, immediately after World War II. Key figure here is Vannevar Bush, who was one of the, one of the uh, leaders of the Manhattan Project, uh, later became director of uh, the National Defense Research Committee during World War II, and was director of the Office of Scientific Research and Development, which later morphed into the National Science Foundation. So Bush was a, was a big advocate at the end of the war of creating a permanent peacetime government military research outfit. And there's a lot of controversy among different uh, government officials about what form this agency should take. Uh, Bush wanted it to be organized uh, through the universities where the government would simply fund research that professors would do at universities. Others, a major player was uh, Senator Harley Kilgore of West Virginia, wanted the government to actually do all the research itself in government-funded labs. There's a very interesting discussion of all this in a great book by the British uh, scientist and historian Terence Keeley, who some of you uh, are familiar with, 
uh, who's one of the most important critics of government-funded science. Um, as Keeley describes this, uh, the, the origins of the National Science Foundation in his book, The Economic Laws of Scientific Research, uh, for Kilgore, this is Keeley, Keeley says, for Kilgore, Senator Kilgore, the major purpose of the National Science Foundation was not the generation of new knowledge, nice though that would doubtless be, but the generation of trained scientists. Kilgore wanted to create a reserve of scientifically trained personnel who could be mobilized for strategic purposes. In other words, ready for the government to call upon them to create technologies of war. Uh, the National Science Foundation, therefore, was created in 1950 in the same year and for the same reasons as the National Security Council. So the NSF, which funds a large amount of scientific research done at U.S. universities, was created not to advance knowledge per se, but as part of the Cold War effort to beat the, to, to beat the Soviets, to dominate the globe, and so on. So the National Science Foundation was part of the national security apparatus uh, in, in every important sense. Uh, now there is some recognition of these problems in the literature. Uh, a very uh, eminent, uh, important historian named Paul Foreman has argued that government funding of science, in, in, especially in physics, uh, distorted scientific progress in physics and got scientists working on the wrong problems problems that the government wanted solved rather than problems that had the greatest potential for uh, the creation of knowledge and, and benefits to society. Uh, Seymour Melman uh, has uh, argued that most of the military R&D spending during the Cold War simply crowded out uh, uh, private spending and that we have worse technologies and less technology today as a result of Cold War military spending on science and R&D than we would have had as an alternative. In other words, think of it this way, that most of, a huge part of the scientific community during the 1950s and 1960s was essentially working for one client, which had its own particular set of needs, and this left these uh, scientists and researchers ill-prepared to deal with commercial clients, who of course had a variety of different kinds of needs and wants, making goods and services for consumers. So, in short, when we look at a company like Apple, or Google, or Facebook, and we marvel at the innovation that these companies produce, we recognize that these innovations are valuable and beneficial to society because they must pass a market test. No one can coerce you into buying Apple's products uh, or, or some other company's products. These innovators must satisfy consumers and they must satisfy their uh, suppliers of capital and so on. They have to produce goods and services that create value to consumers. Uh, the RAND Corporation and the Pentagon, the National Science Foundation and so forth, they do not face any kind of market test. The goods and services that they produce are valuable to the directors and valuable to certain Congress people. And they certainly do provide benefits to researchers in the form of higher pay, access to bigger staffs, lots of toys to play with, and so forth. But there's no market test that gives us any confidence that these innovations are creating anything of economic value. So remember, to economists, value is created by the introduction of goods and services that make consumers better off, as demonstrated by consumers' willingness to pay. The government can create lots of monuments, whether they're atom bombs or statues in Washington, D.C., but these do not create benefit to consumers. They benefit the government, they benefit certain scientists, but they certainly are not uh, in the interests of society. Thank you very much.